You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 126, covering the week of June 18th through June 22nd, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. Before we get started, you can follow us on Twitter. You can like us on Facebook. And you can subscribe to our YouTube page. All those things are tied to the term Abbeville Institute. If you want to look for those things, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all of our social media buttons. Click on those buttons, take you right to our accounts. And because of the new algorithms, particularly in Facebook, if you do like us on Facebook, please share our material around there. It's very hard for us to get traffic through those social media mediums anymore. They are really restricting what we do. Also, if you're at our web page, you can uh, go to the top of the page, give us an email address, and we'll give you a free ebook, Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell. And you'll get our Daily Dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Also, don't forget you can get the Abbeville Institute on the go on our application. Just go to your favorite web app store, whether it's iTunes, Google Play, et cetera, et cetera, and you can get our app. So get our app. You've got our podcast through that. You've got our lectures, free lectures, uh, and, of course, a mobile access to the website. I want to emphasize that thing free, too. The Abbeville Institute website has now well over 1,000 articles dedicated to the Southern tradition and Southern history, Southern uh, culture. Uh, and so it's free. All the things we do are free. And so if you like what we do, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute to keep all of these things free. You can do so at the top of our page where it says support. It'll say donor options. Click on that. We've got a new donor interface. We really hope you use it and you like it. Uh, it's a way to contribute to the Institute. You can contribute monthly or annually. Either one, we have several options out there, or you can donate what you like. Uh, there's, there's options to do that as well. So uh, please consider making a donation to the Institute. It helps keep the podcast going, the website going, our conferences going. And speaking of conferences, we have our summer school coming up in just a couple of weeks now, a little less than a month, uh, at Seabrook Island, South Carolina, Southern Identity Through Music. It's going to be a grand time. We have Bobby Horton as our banquet speaker on Wednesday, July 18th. I'll be speaking at the conference uh, along with uh, several other great talks. So it's really going to be a fun time. It's The summer school is always one of our jewels. So if you want to go, we have very little space left. I'm talking you know, less than maybe 10 slots. Uh, so you want to get in as fast as you can because when it's filled up, we can't take any more people. So all that information is available on our website. Middle of the page, it'll say our 16th annual summer school Click on that. Take you all the information. How to how to sign up. You got to contact Dr. Livingston. So please, if you want to go to our summer school, you got to do it now. You got to get in on it now. So, all right. Uh, all that said, let's talk about the week that was at the Abbeville Institute. And I think one of the main themes for this particular week is image, image. For years, uh, one of the things that um, was readily identifiable in the South were was the Confederate flag, the Confederate battle flag, or now the Navy Jack, but the flag that's become synonymous with uh, everything evil in the South, right? So it's that flag was displayed any time there was some discussion of the South. I mean, that was the image. It didn't matter where you were, whether it was uh, among Confederate veteran groups or just in terms of pop culture. Uh, for example, there was a jazz band in the early 20th century called the Dukes of Dixieland. And every single album they had had an image of the Confederate flag, the Confederate battle flag. Uh, and this was commonplace. I mean, when people talked about the South and Dixie, it was that image. And just that term Dixie was loved. You look at all the bands that played Dixie from the late 19th century up until the middle of the 20th century. Dixie was an American standard, an American standard. It was considered to be a patriotic song in the North, not just in the South, but in the North. People loved this tune. And it wasn't just played by white musicians. 
Many black musicians played it too. Louis Armstrong played it. Kid Ory played it. Just about anybody that played jazz music played Dixie. It's a grand tune. It's a fun time. So the image of the South was the Confederate flag and Dixie. It didn't matter if you were white or black. It didn't matter where you were in the South and the North. It was the image of the South. And somehow, in the last 30 years maximum, more like the last 20 years, that's begun to change. And that's because the image of the South and the way that Southern history is portrayed has started to change. And one of the greatest culprits in that is not, not the left, which, of course, has made a career on race baiting, particularly in the last 30 years. It's not the left. It's really the right that's begun to change that image. And Boyd Cathy's piece that opened the week is Leah Trader really gets into that because he doesn't attack the left in this particular piece. I mean, I think, and I've talked about this before on this, on this podcast, it, you, you expect it out of the left because that's their go-to now. I mean, this is this, they stake their entire political career on demonizing people and slandering people and trying to ruin people. This is what they do. But the real problem is actually the right. And by when I say the right, and of course we talked about this last week with several pieces, but when I say the right, it's the new right. It's the neoconservatives who are those that really have uh, pushed this narrative further than anyone else. And it's amazing that this is the case because you would think that of all groups, they would, they would recognize that the principles behind that flag – uh, in terms of decentralization, uh, a desire to limit the power of the central authority, defiance, these type of things. These would be things that maybe the American right would embrace, particularly when you start talking about the creation of the welfare state or uh, you know, large central government, unconstitutional authority. You would think that they would like that, that this would be something they would they would certainly rally around, but it's not. In fact, they have basically adopted... Eric Foner's perspective on the war and Reconstruction. In fact, many of the neoconservatives will say that Eric Foner is their favorite historian. They'll just outright say it. Hey, Eric Foner's our guy. Uh, and this is problematic because people will go watch Fox News and they'll see Legend and Lies, uh, which, of course, was Bill O'Reilly's title of his book about the war, and it's all about slavery. Everything's about slavery and race. Southerners are all just racist bigots. Uh, and Northerners are righteous individuals fighting to end the institution of slavery. And, of course, they are just good people who love racial equality. I mean, this is the image that you get. If it wasn't for the South, we would have racial equality in America. And uh, all America would, be, would have always been a wonderful place, if not for the South. The South has always been the insignificant other in American history, the problem child that just needs to be eradicated. We could just make the South more like the North. If we could just save the South from itself, America would have been fine. Of course, this belies the entire narrative of American, the real narrative of American history, which was complicity across the board. I mean, America didn't matter for what state you were in. Or, or section you're in, they were all racists. I mean, this is this is just the way it was. Uh, and when you look at slavery, of course, we'll talk about. I'll talk about in a couple of the pieces. Slavery was an American institution, not a Southern institution exclusively. But see, Calhoun pointed out what was going to happen here, and this is exactly what is happening. The reason that the neoconservatives do this is because they think it earns them political points. They think that by demonizing the South, that lefties would somehow vote for them. Well, see, we're not bad people. Don't call us names. Don't slander us uh, because we side with you on these issues. And so vote for us. Vote for us. Um, it's, it's, we're just, we, we don't really want to undermine everything you want. Uh, we, we, we agree with you. And this, of course, would say that Southerners don't agree with you or that, uh, you know, somehow all these people that wave the Confederate flag and, uh, enjoy the South. They're they're all just racist, which of course is not true. But this is what essentially they're implying. We don't we don't side with these people because they're just deplorables. I mean, essentially, what you have in the neoconservatives, they're saying that these other people are deplorables. Now, basically, what they're doing is saying most of America are deplorables because 
uh, or at least a, a plurality of America, are bad people. This is what they're saying. Um, in some ways, this is a soft French Revolution. I mean, nobody's marching people off to the guillotine or saying that you're going to be uh, you know, uh, ostracized or booted out of society or uh, things are going to... But they are destroying things. I mean, monuments are coming down. Symbols are being erased. History is being transformed. The French decided that in order to get rid of the old regime, they had to kill people. Um, in, in the United States, they, that doesn't happen. They just marginalize you and call you bad names. And, of course, that ruins your life. That's the problem. It's a soft French revolution. It really is. I mean, this is what we're facing in modern American society. And so here at the Abbeville Institute, we're trying to fight back against that and trying to show the complexity of American history, the complexity of the South, the good and the bad. We talk about these things. There is no tradition that has uh, 100% positive things. But at the same time, uh, we are in the vanguard of this. I mean, because there are people that, on, even on supposedly our own side, if you just want to say Southerners are conservative, which of course we would you know, look at the Republican Party with disdain because the Republican Party and it has never really changed. I mean, it's, it's always been a strong central government party dedicated to uh, eradicating state power, the original Constitution, uh, these type of things. Lincoln was always interested in that. So uh, it doesn't matter the issue. I mean, this has always been the, the process. It's always been about power. And again, Calhoun pointed this out. What you're going to have is people scrambling for the spoils of government. You're going to have two, power, two parties that claim that the other side is violating the Constitution when they're out of power. And then once they're in power, they're going to violate the Constitution. So essentially what you have are two parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, who believe in strong central authority and will abuse, abuse the Constitution when in power. And it's the Abbeville Institute people who are the remnant who say, look, we don't agree with any of that, with any of that. Uh, and people like us, I mean, you know, we don't represent all the people, but I mean, people like us who uh, say that the central authority is out of control, and that's the major problem. I mean, this is, if you had decentralized government, you wouldn't have so much conflict in America. And of course, uh, by showing the complexity of American history and that uh, it's not all, uh, the South is not always the evil other in American society, um, we uh, try to uh, uh, show that these symbols of the South are not evil symbols. That they were recognized American symbols. The South is America. We've made that point in this podcast many times. The South is America. The South was America. Southerners were valuable contributors to American society, and Americans for generations believed that, even after the war. So was Leah Trader? No. Nobody considered Leah Trader. No one did. No one considered Leah Trader after the war. I talked about this last week when I reviewed the Nicoletti book and the Blair book and how that word traitor was thrown around during the war, of course. But after the war was over, the majority of Americans decided that that was not a legal stance. That was a political stance. And so they changed their tune, substantially changed their tune. So that particular piece by Dr. Kathy is good because it gets into that. And, of course, this gets into image. And so let's skip forward to the Thursday piece, Why Confederate Monuments Matter, for the same reason I just mentioned. Uh, they matter because it represents the South as an image. But this particular piece is written by Samuel Mitchum, who wrote a wonderful book about uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, which we reviewed at, at the Abbey Builder Review. Uh, and he, he says, look, American history is complex. Every, every culture, every people have bad things that they've done. He brings up even Martin Luther King, you know, who, who would be considered to be a homophobe today because he was against gay marriage. Uh, but is anyone, is anyone going to tear down his monument? He says he sincerely hopes not. Uh, he also was an adulterer. And he says, so uh, all these things, does that mean we should tear down King's monument because of the bad things that he did in his life? Well, no. No. Same thing with Lee. I mean, Roosevelt called uh, Lee the most Christ-like American who ever lived, Franklin Roosevelt. 
Churchill called him the most noble man who ever spoke the English language. And to Mitchum, the flag and statues, these monuments, are symbols of resistance to what he calls cultural nihilism. That's really what it comes down to in this. You see, you have to eliminate the South. You have to eliminate its symbols because these symbols represent defiance. And I'll never forget there was a little piece written about Maryland, my Maryland, by some little twit in Time magazine. And he admitted that. He said, look, I mean, this, this song is a song of defiance. And you can't have that if you have a soft French revolution. You can't do it. It's a song of defiance. So music matters. Symbols matter. Pop culture matters. And this is at the heart of what's going on here. And you look at pop culture in various ways. So if you take, for example, the most famous novel that came out of the 1850s, which is Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, it's a piece of propaganda. As John Marcourt points out, our resident scholar in Japan, as he points out, this novel was translated into Japanese. And so Japanese, his, his wife, he lives in Japan, his wife is Japanese. And um, this novel was was translated into Japanese and then printed in Japan. And this is the image that Japanese people got of the South. It's Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so it's a piece of propaganda that had a far-reaching impact across the world, not just the United States. And see, this is what people get now. If you look at you know, what What book are Americans going to read about antebellum America? They're going to read Uncle Tom's Cabin. They're not going to read anything that was written to refute that. And as John or Jack points out, which goes by Jack, as Jack points out, Stowe herself admitted that she really had no contact with the South. I mean, she spent very little time. She spent a, li- a couple of weeks in Kentucky, and supposedly that formed her entire impression of slavery. However, that wasn't it. She actually got it from a book that she read, from an individual who never visited the South either, who wrote the book. I mean, a lot of these abolitionist books were um, written by, uh, supposedly written by former slaves, written by the abolitionists themselves with language they made up. That's really the unknown. And there was a, there was a study done on this. And, you know, for example, the book 12 Years a Slave, which was made into a movie, they, this, these, back in the 80s, these historians, who are by no means pro-Southern, said, well, you can't really trust 12 Years a Slave because um, <laughs> it's dubious that uh, Solomon Northrop wrote all this. And that's the same thing with any of these books that were produced in the 1850s in New England about the South. There were books, of course, that... Um, where abolitionists traveled in the South, or at least, uh, you know, Northerners traveled in the South. Um, and there was a, a interesting book entitled American Slavery As It Is, which uh, it was written by a New Englander who traveled in the South, and he wrote a, a book saying, well, I mean, this is what I see from slavery. And he was criticized, I mean, run a, raked over the coals for this thing because he, he didn't tow the abolitionist line. Uh, about Southern society. But see, it doesn't matter because it's an image. What Stowe did was create an image of the South, a straw man, so to speak, that had to be taken down. It wasn't necessarily that Americans, uh, I mean, the majority of Americans didn't believe her book, but it became an image, and that image now is what people get in American education. And so the South has to be taken down. Anything that has to do with the South or the Old South, the antebellum South. And, of course, symbols and monuments, Confederate symbols and monuments, are part of that. They have to be taken down because it's Harriet Beecher Stowe, you see. So in some ways, what's happening in America is Southerners are losing the popular culture war, a war that they were winning for decades because Southern symbols were seen as just a part of America. That's it. Just a part of America. They're just a part of of a section of America. They represent a people. They don't represent anything that has to do with race or slavery. They they, they, They represent a people. If you see the Confederate flag, oh, those are Southerners. You see the Dukes of Dixieland album? There you go. Uh, You see the Confederate, uh, the Confederates, which was a barbershop quartet, which we talked about, who wore Confederate uniforms. And this is seen as great. You've got 
uh, northerners writing songs about the South all the time, about how wonderful it was. That's actually the, one of the uh, topics of my talk at the summer school. They did it all the time. Uh, this was seen as a, an, an unmistakable part of America and a part of America that should be embraced, and they loved it. And Dixie was part of that, this song Dixie. And so let's just talk about that music part here for a second. On Tuesday, we ran a piece entitled uh, Rock and Roll Civil War. It's about um, an individual in Missouri. His name is Chris Edwards, who wrote or has is, is written um, essentially rock and roll plays about the war in Missouri. Now, this is an interesting way to bring a nuanced view of the war um, to a greater population. People love music. Music was a way that people obtained, and still is a way that they can obtain their history. And so what he's doing is he wrote a play, almost an opera, based on a rock and roll opera based on the war in Missouri. And we, we've linked to um, one of the songs from that particular uh Opera or music opera that he's written. It's, it's. I mean, to call it an opera. It's a rock and roll uh, ensemble that they they portray history through it. This is not a new idea. Back in the in the uh, seven late seventies and early eighties, there were a couple of albums produced this way that had people like Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings and Charlie Daniels, and uh, it was about Missouri and then also uh, the war itself. Um, but this is a way to, and as he says, it's a way to reach kids. It's a way to reach people. Um, and, you know, he says he says if we could just talk about these things, it would resolve a lot of issues. If people say you're in the SCV, you're automatically painted as a racist. He says that's unfair. It's unfair. Um, and so he's written these rock and roll pieces that get into the war to explain what's going on. And, of course, the, the unfortunate part about this, and I, I think it's the – it's a critique of American society now. You can't really say that, you know, Southerners were uh, abused by the North because neoconservatives will say, well, they had deserved it. I mean, this is the thing. Well, they deserved it. They're bad people. Bad people deserve to be abused. This is the unfortunate part about, and this is where, you know, uh, Boyd Cathy gets into this in his piece on Lee. People like Victor Davis Hanson will essentially say the South deserved it. They deserve to be punished. They deserve to be abused. Their infrastructure deserved to be destroyed. These people deserved the poverty that followed. They deserved it because they were traitors. They deserved these things. Whereas someone like Edwards would say, well, I mean, this is bad stuff. You don't. You were killing people, stealing their stuff, burning their homes down. That's bad. That's a, that's a war crime. That's an atrocity. No, no. Not to people that, I mean, people that say the South was evil. They deserve all these things. They deserve the punishment. These people, these Americans, deserved it. The thing was, Americans after the war didn't think that at all. Bring them back in. Let them up easy, as Lincoln said. They don't deserve that kind of punishment, that kind of abuse, that kind of treatment. They don't deserve it. But that's not the mainstream narrative. Again, it's not the pop culture narrative. It's these people deserve to die. And not only that, anyone who still believes in what they believe in deserves to be marginalized or believes in the principles of decentralization or enjoys Southern symbols, these people deserve to be marginalized. They're not real Americans. They're un-American, as the as their critique goes. I mean, this is this is silly stuff. It really is silly. It's it's you almost can't parody it. Uh, and how silly it is. How ahistorical it is. But this is where we are in the twenty first century. And it's unfortunate because the South has been and long been a valuable contributor. Southern culture and traditions have been a valuable contribution to American life. There's a reason why Northerners in the early 20th century and also African Americans who were writing minstrel tunes talked about going down to the South because it's great. Uh, and, and if you want that, you can you can if you can come to the summer school, I'll talk about this. I'll, I'll I'll give you some pretty concrete examples of this. I mean, not pretty, very concrete examples of this. Um, how New York was awful, but the South was great. And this is what people thought. Let's go down to the South. Let's go down to Alabama. It's great down there. 
Love it. That's what I like about the South. Got good food, warm people, warm climate, hospitality. We love Dixie. And so that gets into this last piece of the week, uh, the attack on Dixie and sports and music. Again, this is pop culture. These things matter. People love sports, and they love music. Two things across the board in American society. Now, you mean you find people that don't like sports, and you find people that don't really listen to much music. Um, but this, the fact is, most Americans do like these things. And this is something that's not unique to, to the United States. People all over the world love these things. They love music. They love sports. And um, the fact is, Dixie, through sports, was seen as a representation of America. In fact, uh, as uh, Michael Martin brings up in this piece, um, a lot of Southern schools played Dixie when they played the marching, uh, when they played the, the national anthem. Uh, they played Dixie as well. Um, and that tradition goes back uh, when Alabama defeated the University of Washington in the 1926 Rose Bowl. The Atlanta Georgian said, and he quotes this, that this was the greatest victory for the South since the first Battle of Bull Run. And the Atlanta Journal said, the Crimson Tide no longer belongs exclusively to Tuscaloosa and the state of Alabama. It belongs to the whole South, just like the Stone Mountain Memorial. And when the Alabama Crimson Tide returned to the Rose Bowl in 27, the marching band performed the song Dixie as the players stormed the field. Everyone recognized this was North against South. This was a way for the South to beat the North. And we used to have the Blue-Gray game. I mean, you think about it, there was a college foot, it's a college all-star game called the Blue-Gray game because it was the South against the North. It was college sports. It was a manifestation of this sectional conflict. In the 20th century, we're not going to shoot each other anymore, but we're going to beat each other up on the football field. And Dixie was seen as the tune of the South. Uh in 1941, uh, he says, uh, in a game against Yale, uh, college topics reported a thousand hands lifted the Confederate battle flag, and fans from both teams sang Dixie at halftime to mark the first documented example of Confederate recognition in a Virginia football game. Virginia against Yale. He says the situation was best exemplified when Dixie was played in 1947 after an African-American tackle from Harvard, Chester Pierce, broke the Southern color line in a home game at Charlottesville. Many accounts show that Pierce received applause upon leaving, and he even stated, quote, I don't recall a hint of anything racial on the field. I remember nothing different in, the, in that game from any other game I played at Harvard. It was no big deal and took no courage by me. Uh, so, again, this was, I mean, nobody cared. Dixie was part of America. Everyone played Dixie. I guess Louis Armstrong, he played Dixie, was a racist because... Southern jazz bands, Dixieland jazz bands, that's what it was called, played Dixie. Uh, 1962, the Florida Gators, which we have a picture on the website of this, wore Confederate flags on their helmets, and they entered the stadium to the tune of Dixie as they defeated the favorite Penn State and went at the Gator Bowl. It was actually put on their, because it was, it was seen as, you know, Penn State thought that they were lowering themselves to play Florida in this game. Uh, that was the reason, you know. Florida, uh, Penn State was complaining they had to play Florida, and uh, so Florida put the flag on the helmet and said, "All right, you think it, you have to lower yourself to play a Southern school?" And they beat them. <laughs> that was the funny part. They beat them. So that flag went to war against Pennsylvania and won, and won. Uh, so this is the thing. I mean, this is why sports and music matter. And, of course, uh, you know, in music, now Dixie's been eliminated. You can't even have Elvis's uh, American Trilogy. You can't do that anymore because it has Dixie in it. And people complain about this. I don't like that that song. It's got Dixie, that, that racist song in it. Racist in what way? Everyone loved Dixie. It's a great tune. It is a great tune. People played it. It was representative of the South, not just not just white Southerners, but black Southerners. Black Southerners love this thing. That's the issue in America. It goes back 
to, of course, education. It goes back to the creation of an image from a certain section of American society, popular culture, what these things mean. Uh, and when you have uh, people like, or a group like the neoconservatives pur pursuing an agenda among conservatives that would say that the South is the evil other in American society, well, that's what you're going to get. And it's the perpetuation of, of a, a false narrative in pop culture that makes these things bad. The real evil in this is that what you're trying to do is tell Southerners who have a blood tie to these people that fought for the South that their ancestors are forfeit. Their ancestors should be eliminated from society. You have to spit on your own people. That is not just wrong. It's evil. But that's what's happening in America today. And unfortunately... Um, it seems to be gaining steam because of, not because of the left, but because of the quote-unquote right. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that we try to push back against and show you know, there is valuable things in the South, and these things are not evil, these things are not wrong, um, and that being proud of the good parts of the Southern tradition is a wonderful thing to be. And Americans for decades believed the same way. Until next time, good day.